Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our Lunch and Learn Information and Support Session. This is the seventh of eight noon hour webinars hosted by the Breast and Gynae Cancer Center of Hope. My name is Kathleen Helgeson and I'm the coordinator of the Patient and Family Resource Center. I'm joined today by Lori Santoro and Cheryl Dizon Renante, who will be sharing their knowledge and answering your questions about returning to work after treatment. We are very pleased to offer this webinar with the generous funding support of the Cancer Care Manitoba Foundation. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that we're meeting from all regions in Manitoba, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe Cree, Oje Cree, and Dene people, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. It's important for us to foster reconciliation and inclusion and to encourage others to do the same. Before we continue, there are some basic Zoom features that I'd like to explain. You'll notice as an attendee, your microphone and your video are turned off. If you have a question for Cheryl or for Lori at any time during the presentation, just click on the Q&A icon on your screen and type your question. You can also choose to send that question anonymously by checking the send anonymously box before you click on the blue arrow to send. My coworker, Allie, is also here off screen and she will be helping us manage your questions as they come in. If you have a technical concern, you can also ask Allie in the Q&A and she will answer your question privately and try to assist you. Our presenters today often work together delivering support services to women diagnosed with breast cancer. Lori is a patient and family educator at the Breast and Cancer Breast and Gynae Cancer Center of Hope, and Lori is a counselor here at Cancer Care who specializes in breast and prostate cancer. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. And so I believe, Lori, that you're going to lead our discussion um, this morning or this afternoon. <laughs> Absolutely. All righty. Can you see that? No, we just, we're not seeing your slides there, Lori. Okay, let's try that again. There, I think it's oh. coming up now. We just, yeah. Do you see the PowerPoint? Not yet. Okay. Da, 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 da. <laughs> How's that? We don't have it there yet either. Good grief, eh? Do you want me to bring it up here on my computer? Sure. Okay, let me do that. Unless you can still get it there. Oh, there it is. Oh, oh there you okay, go, you have it. <laughs> Eureka, Perfect. you found it. Good? Yeah, All thank good. you. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about returning to work after cancer treatments today. And we know that this is one of our hot topics that we hear lots about. And a lot of people have questions about, you know, when should I return to work or how does that return to work look like? So we're going to spend some time talking about that. And our learning objectives, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to describe factors that can determine work readiness. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about some brain fog challenges and some tips and strategies on how to deal with some of the symptoms before and after a return to work. And we're gonna share some of the resources um, that are available to help you. Um, one thing I like to uh, just highlight is, although this session is called returning to work after cancer, we know that some people work throughout their treatments, mm -hmm. whether it be financial reasons, perhaps someone um, um, doesn't have a sick benefit uh, disability plan. Um, some employers are flexible, you know, maybe on the week that you have your treatments, you're not um, actually working, but then you can kind of pick up and do a little bit of work as you start to feel better in between treatments. Some people feel that, um, that they need the distraction during going, you know, the cancer treatment, trying to have some sort of normalcy. And some people that I've uh, worked with over the years find that when they're done their treatments, they feel like they need a bit of a break to kind of recover and process things because they really haven't had the opportunity to do that 
while they were working and doing the treatments together. So some people find that they might need to take a little bit of a pause. Mm -hmm. And that could be a challenge because some employers or coworkers might think, well, you're done now. Why do you need to have that time? So it's very important to acknowledge people who continue to work through treatment. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just take a moment and and poll our audience? Yeah, and um, just, I'm gonna launch a poll to your screen. So um, you can take a moment and we're just gonna ask you at the time of your cancer diagnosis, uh, were you working and, um, or if not? So take a moment and just um, reflect on that. And if you don't have the poll, if it doesn't show up on your screen, you can also share your comment in the Q&A and Ali will relay it to us. So we'll just um, check in and see how many people were working at the time of their diagnosis. This poll is such a neat feature, Kathleen, because then Mm. we can see who, even though we can't see you all, we can get a sense of who we're talking to. That's great. It helps a little bit, these little tools that that are the only way that we can reach out to people. (laughs) But okay, we've got about 80% of our people having um, voted. So I'm just going to um, end the poll and then share the poll with you. And then I'll get maybe Lori to comment on those results. Can you see that? Yeah. 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 So lots of people were working, few retired, Mm -hmm. nobody in school. Isn't that interesting? Hey, Mm -hmm. not working and working part time. So a good variety of um, people. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. After the cancer treatments, we do know that recovery takes time and it's very common to need three to six months or more. Um, You know, some people go back quite quickly. Some people might, um, you know, start thinking about it. Uh, Some people might need more time. It depends really on how much you've been through, how you've been coping, how you've been feeling and managing side effects. And we often uh, talk about thinking as a return to work as part of your recovery, so that you feel less pressure on yourself uh, to get back to work. It's something to work towards, um, but we know it takes time. So depending on the type of cancer you've had, the surgery and treatments, the side effects, other health issues. Um, I've met a few people that were off for other health reasons prior to their diagnosis. So you've got a kind of a complicated uh, situation. It really depends on the type of work you do. You know, if you're doing customer service and you're uh, grumpy and and emotional, that's going to be a hard challenge to go back to work quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, If it's a very physical job, you need that physical energy, that stamina and the ability uh, to do that physical work. And also, it depends on your mental health, such as anxiety, depression, stress, and those types of things. Research and experience with those who have been off to work, off work for illness uh, or injury show that the longer someone is away from work, the harder it is to go back to work. And so while you're away, uh, things are changing at work. And it really does, um, you know, take some time to kind of build your way back there. Um, And there's things that you can be doing uh, to help with your recovery, um, which is what we're going to talk about today. It seems like the employer's expectations would also be a big factor here. Like if there were, if you were getting a lot of pressure to come back, that that would influence your decision, I would think. Absolutely. And, Mm -hmm. and we've heard both Cheryl and I, I'm sure, um, you know, over the years that, you know, when are you coming back? The minute they got a, uh, you know, the sniff that your treatment is finished, you know, the phone starts ringing and people are um, looking for that return to date, return to work date. Mm-hmm. And, and really, it, it, it's a very individual thing. And, you know, if people are feeling really pressured about that, you know, that's where um, talking with Cheryl uh, or Renee, her coworker, um, Michelle and I, we talk about, you know, what are the, what's the situation and how you're feeling about that return to work. And often, you know, if you're getting that pressure from disability or from your employer, 
you know, um, my doctors and I were, are discussing that and you'll know when we know kind of thing and mm -hmm. just kind of leave it at that. Don't make promises. Yeah. So Cheryl, you're going to talk a little bit more about the emotional aspects, I guess. Yeah, you yeah. bet, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so if you're all here, which you are, you know, you might be on the trajectory at some point kind of wondering, hmm, am I ready? You know, is this the point where I kind of start to think about returning to work or volunteer life or, or whatever, you know, you, you want to set your goals upon. So um, some things that we'll talk about and, and get you thinking about is uh, one, you know, have your side effects improved? And two, are you back to doing your usual activities? Because what we like to kind of point out is that returning to work is a process and you might have a plan in your head and your doc might have a plan and you know your boss might have a plan but really um, you're kind of the quarterback like is, is kind of what we really encourage is that you know how you feel you know your capabilities and you are able to communicate that with your team and so knowing that uh, that's the intention to have a plan but if it needs to be tweaked or changed along the way that's okay too you know, because the end goal for everybody is that you get back to work or your activities in a safe and, and successful way. Mm -hmm. well, why don't we do our, our second poll just to check in with our audience about Great. Um, they, their feelings around returning to work. So um, in this case, you can also reflect on if you've already gone back to work, you could reflect on how you felt returning to work or if you're in the process of making that or deliberating, then you can um, reflect on how you're feeling now. So mm -hmm. I just want to take a moment and um, weigh in on this poll. That's a great spectrum of, of emotions there, <laughs> Kathleen, that you've captured. <laughs> yeah. And even the last one, feeling unsure, that's pretty valid and normal, you know, like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Well, let's um, just, we'll just give it a, another few seconds here. And somebody um, also a question for you guys to consider about returning to work with fears about COVID-19. So maybe you might be able to um, comment a little bit on that too. So what I'll do is I'll share the poll right now. Um, so I'll end the polling and share the results. Can you see that? Mm -hmm the results there, Cheryl? Did you I want to sure comment? Can. Thanks, Kathleen. So yeah, like again, because Kathleen did such a good job with, you know, her, her spectrum of emotions here, you've all hit on some of these main points. So feeling anxious or overwhelmed is certainly, you know, part of uh, the norm of what we see. Um, apprehensive, you know, is in there as well. Um, as well, kind of like further into the spectrum of readiness is excited and prepared. So some of you are kind of landing in that spot too and um, then there's absolutely the, the conflicted and unsure you could be all over the place and and that would be mm -hmm. certainly understandable yeah and I guess like as you said it's a spectrum so it's not not um, abnormal to go from one to the other and back and forth and without really feeling like you're landing on a certain way of feeling like you're feeling some days you might really feel apprehensive and then other days you're you're excited and feel ready Oh, 100% Kathleen. Okay, I'm going to just stop sharing that poll then now and Great. And, and I am noting, Laurie and I, the question about uh, COVID-19. So maybe we'll just park that for, for a second into some of our, our challenges section. Is, does that sound okay, Laura? And we sure. touch on that in a bit. So, so yeah, so um, moving further along into the presentation, a lot of um, women that we work with, they take steps prior to the return to work and after treatment to build resiliency. And so that could be uh, physical, mental, emotional, and, and social wellness, right? I mean, there's certainly different parts of us. And so some women say, you know, have adopted doing daily exercise. Um, oh, Lori, no worries. I'll just I have my slides here so I, I can keep talking. <laughs> Um, but daily exercise is certainly something that uh, some women incorporate into their everyday routine. Reading, you know, if you're a reader, doing that kind of stuff, something that really engages in self-care. 
as well as talking to people you trust. Some people, in order to address their emotional wellness, um, they need to kind of unpack their experience over the last, say, year or two and kind of, you know, uh, assess with somebody like me, um, you know, what happened and how am I feeling about all of this? How am I feeling about the future? So that's part of their emotional wellness, uh, as well as also kind of building up that resiliency to engage with people, so social wellness as well. So um, even in amongst COVID, you know, ensuring that you have regular phone chats and, and video visits as well with people in your life can kind of get you working towards, you know, eventually interacting once again with colleagues and, and, and people in the workplace. And so the next question that I kind of get to hear, though, is how do I fit in self-care now that I'm returning to work, right? Because you've done such a good job of, you know, these are the things that I need to do every day to feel good. And I guess the answer to that question would be uh, gradually, you know, mm -hmm. um, we'll talk about a graduated schedule and return to work in a bit. Um, but as you kind of build up those work hours, you kind of still prioritize um, wellness activities, you might have to kind of fiddle around with when to do them or how long. Um, but eventually, you'll kind of get into a bit of a groove. And so, yes, yeah, so prioritizing, you know, one to two wellness activities per day. So if you love those daily walks, keep them in your schedule, you know, even if you return to work. Um, and that sometimes involves uh, taking care of practical things uh, on the weekends. So a woman I know, you know, she makes sure she does her meal prep on the weekends, right? So she doesn't have to worry about cooking during the work week. And so scheduling laundry and, and grocery shopping and things like that on uh, Friday night, Saturday, Sundays, that works for a lot of women. Um, and delegating household responsibilities whenever possible. So if your family or friends or, or you know, um, other people in your life have jumped in and, and taken over some of the household tasks, maybe that's something to keep, you know, from now on so that you feel like you'll still be able to get your sense of individual wellness. So yes, yeah, so, so challenges though, you know, we, we do want to address that because they can, especially if you're not ready for it, can affect your return to work. And so Laurie, if you uh, flip to the next screen, uh, what I'll touch on right now is emotional wellness going back to work. So sometimes um, people notice that this list here of, of um, things to notice pop up either frequently or intensely. Um, so episodes of tearfulness and low motivation, things that kind of fall under depressive symptoms or high anxiety where it's very difficult to focus on tasks. Um, sometimes that can be related to fear of recurrence, um, which falls close to anxiety on, on that spectrum of things. Um, sometimes um, in grief, you know, there is a, a sense of uh, losing um, life as, as you knew it prior to the diagnosis. So accompanying the, those feelings of grief and loss can be feeling alone or stuck, and that's certainly normal, um, as well as a loss of self-confidence and identity. Um, and so if you, if you felt any or all of those, that's certainly valid um, and, and normal for, for um a cancer diagnosis and treatment. Um, however, if you're finding that they're still happening a lot or, or frequently, or they're getting in the way of daily functioning, um, it might be time to kind of give one of us a call, you know, consult or consult with your doctor, just to kind of unpack what's going on. And so we can help your problem solve a little bit. So yes, yeah, emotional wellness is key uh, prior to returning to work, as well as, Lori, if you flip to the next slide for me, thank you, energy levels. So we hear a lot of the time, I, I think um, fatigue is, is across the board, uh, the number one, or at least in the top three reported symptoms that people uh, find after or during treatment. And that lingers on for a long time, but it's something that nobody can measure, you know? 
and it much less explain. So spoon theory, it's it sounds scientific, well, sort of, but it's actually not. It's it's actually more of a metaphor or a way, an analogy, a way to kind of understand yourself, how much energy you have, and to explain it to other people. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, there's a quote there from a doctor, a neurologist, and he says, using analogies and metaphors, they can help clinicians and Oh, we froze there. We're having all sorts of technical problems there. Yeah, we oh, can see you now. Can yeah, you see me. Oh yeah, dear. Yeah, okay. Okay. We froze for a second. Great. Did Did you hear my quote or not my quote? You were halfway <laughs> through it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's let's take it from the top. Yeah. Using analogies or metaphors can help clinicians and patients' loved ones get a better understanding of the impact of specific activities on a patient um, and their energy levels. So this is a little bit of a, a rough chart here, but some people might find it takes, you know, one spoonful of energy to get up every day and get or get dressed, two spoonfuls of energy to watch a show or heat up a meal in the microwave, three spoonfuls of energy to cook a meal from scratch or clean a little bit or do something creative, and four energy, sorry, four spoonfuls of energy to uh, take a shower, um, get ready for the day, drive a car, travel into work, and, and engage with other people. So prior to treatment, maybe you might have had, you know, between 20 to 25 spoonfuls of energy a day you know, and it wasn't even a thing. Uh, but now, you know, you're still recovering, you might find you have, you know, 12 spoonfuls of energy, maybe about 50% half that. And that if you've had a rough night's sleep, you got to take away some spoons, you know, mm -hmm. and actually kind of be kind to yourself and go, okay, I've had a rough night, or I've had these symptoms happening. I've got 12 spoons to work with the next day. Um, and that's what I've got. And if you're comfortable to tell that to a manager or supervisor or you know explain it in that way um, so that people kind of get it I hope that makes sense Kathleen for Marie. sure yeah no it does and and I and I I'd like you to kind of um, comment on these questions because I think they we, you talked earlier about having some uh, room to do some self-care um, strategies too which also takes energy right so just mm -hmm. getting through the daily stuff and then having this leftover spoonfuls of energy for the, the self-care things that you may mm -hmm. have been doing. So somebody um, made a comment that they don't feel they have any wiggle room for self-care because they're a single mom. Um, any suggestions that you have for that situation? Oh, yeah, that can be really tough, right? I mean, because you're right, self-care does require some spoonfuls of energy. Um, and I guess my, um, my hope in that, you know, if you've been trying different kinds of coping strategies, self-care things, that you actually find an activity or two that doesn't just drain the spoonfuls of energy, but actually builds it up. So that's actually in addition to this theory is if, say, um, meditation, or, um, for example, doing yoga, that actually gets the, the spoon barometer up to try to find those um, so that you can um, actively work towards increasing energy levels. Um, and again, touching again on the practical stuff, try to do as much of the practical stuff on the weekends. Mm -hmm. So lunch prep for your kids, um, laundry, getting them to help out as much as possible. I don't know what the age range is of kids, but that delegating, you know, of responsibilities to, to them too, as much as possible, because it could be really a juggling act for you. I hear it. Absolutely. And and also, I think that what you're saying is really true in terms of looking at some of those self-care um, practices as not energy draining, but energy building, and that, that we know that to be true for a lot of physical exercises that even though it can feel exhausting to do it, it, it can actually start to build and increase your, your energy levels by getting more active. Um, somebody, somebody else um, mentioned, is it okay to feel very tired after work? as long as they rest well on the weekends or whenever possible. So is that something that you guys have heard people going back to work and feeling very exhausted at the end of the day? Absolutely. You and Lori are nodding. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Some people find that, especially in that initial uh, time period where you're starting to increase your work hours, um, often where you were feeling pretty energetic, that 
energy level definitely comes down because now you're spending your energy in a different way than you have been while you're off work, right? So you're working mentally harder, your work brain is, is going back on. And so, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about is gradually returning to work. And that's where if you go up too far in the amount of hours you're working, maybe you need to bring that down a little bit or hold still for a little bit till you get adjusted um, because mm -hmm. you're going to run out of energy. Yeah. And somebody else also commenting that they're just finding they can't maintain their regular exercise routine um, because they're during the week, they're just so tired from work. They just don't have the energy to do it. And any thoughts about how they can still fit in some kind of routine when their energy is not there, or should they just be putting it aside for now? I think it's important to still try and do something, even walking it is really helpful. And maybe if you're going physically to work, maybe you're going, you know, you're parking a little further away, right? And you're doing a little bit more walking um, or intentionally having a break where you can go for a little walk. Um, you know, even 10 minutes or 15 minutes, a couple of times a day adds up to your exercise. Mm -hmm. um, and just those little spurts of energy that comes from a little bit of a walk might be enough to kind of carry you through your day, um, you know, and as hard as it is, it's kind of that negative circle that we talked about when we talked about fatigue and sleep and those types of things, you know, the more fatigued you are, the less active you are and the more fatigued you get, and it just mm -hmm. kind of keeps chasing its tail. Right. And so intentionally, whether you set a timer on your phone, um, you know, or if you've got to walk somewhere, like some days when I go to the washroom, I've got to walk to, to the sixth washroom to find one open sometimes, right? And it might take me five minutes there, five minutes back, right? And then I've had a little uh, break um, and I have a little bit more energy. And so just looking for little ways to build in a few extra steps mm -hmm. um, sometimes can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Some people might need an actual rest during the workday. I'll never forget one of my ladies many years ago when she was planning her back to work. She says, I need somewhere where I can lay down and have a nap if I need to. And if you can't give me that, then I'm not coming back <laughs> because I'm still not back to not having naps. Mm -hmm. and, and the employer wanted her back and said, absolutely, we'll give you whatever you need, you know, and that might not be practical in all settings, but it's kind of looking at what you need to help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. All right. So brain fog, we pick on brain fog in this uh, category of return to work because we know up to 75% of patients going through cancer treatment do have some sort of brain fog. We used to call it chemo brain and we know that it's not just patients with chemotherapy. It's, you know, the cancer diagnosis and the surgeries and the treatments, the menopause, the poor sleep, the stress. There's so many factors that impact how your brain is working. So when that comes to, um, you know, affecting your daily life, you might have concentration uh, challenges, uh, the ability, the inability to focus. Uh, some people have trouble reading or prioritizing things, multitasking. Um, and so, you know, it, it, your job may have changed, you know, while you were away, or a lot of people that have been off during COVID, you know, people are working from home, and how do I work with my team virtually? And so there's those kind of challenges, which can also increase anxiety about returning to work. Most things are like that old saying of, you know, you ride a bike, you know, you can always remember how to ride a bike. Um, and most people find that if they can settle down their worries and think about the things that they did in their job, they might have, um, you know, just be kind of that anxiety bit. Um, but sometimes it does take, you know, how do I use my keyboard can be a challenge when you've got brain fog. Um, so uh, brain fog can affect how you think, your memory, problem solving, and it does impact your anxiety um, and your mood, because um, most people I find, they struggle with appearing to be like a space cadet, you know, 
oh, I'm not going to remember so-and-so's name, or I'm not going to be able to figure this out. And um, that causes that stress when you have those little slip ups and screw ups where you're not able to stay on top of things, it kind of affects your self esteem. And that just kind of starts a little bit of a vicious circle. So when we're heading back to work, some of those challenges would be difficulty answering questions quickly, you know, that you're being put on the spot and it's like blank, you know, where you got to find that information shifting from one task to another. You may have left work, you know, humming along and doing all these things uh, all at the same time. Your brain doesn't work that way, maybe not anymore or at this time. So how am I going to manage that? And I always talk about, you know, setting yourself up there to say, you know, do I want to go back and do things the way I did? Maybe I was overextending myself and doing too many things. And maybe now this is my chance to kind of back that off a little bit and maybe set some new parameters. Being able to follow instructions, um, you know, and remembering the details of conversations and meetings and those types of things. Um, getting your workplace organized um, and being able to set, set things up. Um, remembering your train of thought, you know, going blank mid-sentence. Very, very very common. Remembering the specific words or names where that's on the tip of your tongue and you, you just for the life of you, you can't um, figure that out. And just following the flow of events, what normally, you know, you have to plan a party and make an invitation and buy all the supplies and invite the guests, all those little steps that we do to do the big party may not be so uh, simple to do now. So that's very, very important. Um, just to be kind of thinking about those types of things and thinking about your own work. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of those tips for planning that return to work. And, you know, spending some time working through some of these things may just kind of help alleviate some of those stresses, may point you in the direction of maybe you need to talk to someone and get some support or education around other things. So setting yourself up for success, you know, one of the things that's, um, you know, sometimes helpful is to share, you know, that I'm experiencing brain fog. Um, and I find that it takes me a little longer to do things. I'm able to do them, but it just, I need some grace and some support around that. Um, you know, some people feel comfortable sharing that. I've given them some articles to share about brain fog, that it is a real thing, that these are some of the challenges and usually it's getting better, um, usually around, the, you know, at the latest two years or so, but, um, you know, some people it might be a little longer than that. Um, Laurie? Up, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, sorry, Laurie, there's a yeah. question just, I think that it sort of um, yeah, applies here away. because um, some of this involves like, you know, sharing with an employer that you've already been working with. Um, we had a question from some one of our viewers that said that they lost their job um, um, after treatment. They had been working part-time and now they wanna start looking for a new job in the next few months, but they're concerned about the diagnosis of cancer getting in the way of being hired. Mm. So, you know, when somebody might ask, well, what have you been doing and how come you have, haven't been working? There's this gap in your, in your work history what is your suggestion for, um, you know, whether to share that information with a potential employer? You're not obligated to share that information. You know, you could, could be telling them that you've been off work for a period of time um, for some medical issues, but, you know, you're back on track and you're looking, mm -hmm. um, looking to get back to work. Yeah. Um, there's, um, you know, depending on the type of job uh, and those types of things, you know, they may give you, you know, a skills test, right? If it's typing a letter, for example, there may be some, some limitations there on what your abilities are. Um, so it depends really on the type of job. Um, finding out ahead of time, if you're getting to an interview, uh, what's involved in the interview. Most times they'll share, you know, there's a typing test if it's one of those positions, right? Or um, sometimes you have to give a presentation, you know, d again, depending upon the uh, job. So it's, it's what you're comfortable with. Um, and it's important to know that you can talk to Cheryl and I um, or our colleagues 
around some of those things and preparing for job interviews. And we're going to talk about a, a few of the resources at the end, near the end. Yeah. Right, thank you. Yeah. Time management is a big thing. And when you're kind of feeling scattered and um, um, disorganized in your mind, you tend to be disorganized in your space. And again, it depends on the type of job you're trying to go back to or to get. So having to-do lists, you know, having a priority list, you know, where, where if you make a to-do list, put one, two, three, four beside the ones that you need to work in order. Often it's important to start with the, um, maybe the more difficult ones or the more important ones first while your brain is at its sharpest so that hopefully that will go a little smoother than waiting till you're a little more fatigued. Using calendars, paper or electronic. Some people still like the old fashioned calendar as Cal Kathleen's got it behind her <laughs> wall there. She's got all her lists and things, right? All in um, writing. <laughs> but it's important that if you're using an electronic one and a paper one that you have to match them up so that you're not getting things fumbled, right? Um, what I like about the electronic calendars is you can set little pop-up reminders. Bing, you've got a meeting in 15 minutes. Oh, I gotta get focused on that, right? Timers are a great little thing, and we do have them on our phones. Um, and, you know, if you've got, you know, 10 minutes to purge emails or to check emails or something like that, set your timer, go hard at it. And then when it's done, you're on track. And it just kind of keeps you managing chunks of time. Cell phones are a great thing, not only for scheduling appointments and keeping track of things, but you can take a photo of something. I've parked my car at this door of the mall. You know, um, I've taken a picture of my garage door. My garage door is down. Like there's different things that you can use that cell phone for, um, for that, you know, um, putting in a calendar, right? I also downloaded um, a tape recorder. I've got the old archaic tape, tape recorder on the screen, but there's apps now that will tape record things. So if you have to take minutes for a meeting, you know, it's important to share that I'm taping this because I want to make notes for myself later. Um, but that can help you kind of replay things because I, I know myself when I'm at a meeting and I'm listening and writing things down, um, I, you know, I'm writing and I'm focusing on writing. I'm, I'm losing things with the current conversation. So those are little tips um, to help with that. A brain book. I call it a brain book. Write down anything and everything. So if someone comes up to you and says, hey, uh, I'm needing that report about this thing. Um, what's going on with that thing? oh, I'm just in the middle of something, uh, um, I'll get back to you. And you write it down in your little brain book. That way you can, you don't have to do that on the spur of the moment kind of response and stand there and think what was going on with that thing. Put it in your brain book and write it down. Um, if you're not sure about something, if something pops up in the middle of doing something else, add it to your brain book. Um, you know, phone messages. Um, you know, I always have a little code when I do my uh, phone messages that, you know, I've got the message written down when I've spoken to the person, I put a check mark. And when I've charted in the chart, I put an X through my check mark. So it's my little mental system of keeping things on task. Um, you know, take it to meetings, um, have it open on your desk, ready to use and use that as your backup. Try not to multitask. You know, focusing on one thing at a time is very important when you have brain fog. This helps to keep you on track. You've got less room for errors because then you're not popping around to different things all at the same time. And again, going back to that self-esteem, the more successful you are at finishing things, the better you're going to feel about things and feeling that sense of accomplishment. Because there's nothing worse than going home at the end of the day thinking you've done nothing finish, you know, to the finish. Hitting the pause button, you know, before you accept tasks or appointments, you know, I'll check on that and I'll get back to you. That's your pause to say, am I really feeling overextended? Is it really something I can manage in my schedule? Do I have deadlines that I need to meet? All those types of things. It's good to just, you're giving them an answer that I'll check and get back to you. Write it in your brain book. <laughs> 
Um, you know, and it's okay to decline things, you know, if it's really not going to work for you, you know, and, and saying that's not going to work for me right now. I'm sorry, maybe next time. Right. Um, it's okay to say no, it's okay. And that's something we're not used to doing. We're used to pleasing people and trying to do it all for everybody. This isn't the time to do that. You got to take care of yourself. And that's one of the ways to do self-care. Reduce stress. You know, there, when there's so much going on, you just need to take that pause. If you're feeling very overwhelmed, that's where that getting up and going for a quick little walk is a great way to, to do it. This girl's doing some meditation, right? Maybe you're um, walking, you know, if you've got nowhere, you're working in a group where people are, maybe you're going to the bathroom and doing a couple of little stretches or, you know, getting outside and having a breath of fresh air. Um, just pausing and resetting things, remembering you can only do one thing at a time. You can't do it all. And you just got to stop and refocus on what is most important. I think something you just said, Lori, is worth repeating because <laughs> it, it, it's a really good point that you said about saying no as a means of self-care. Yeah. And I, I think that's a really, really good point to, to think about that if you're having trouble figuring out how do I fit self-care into my schedule, just try saying no more often. That's right. That's yeah, right. that's a really good you know, point. And especially when you're trying to change how you work, right? Uh, you, you may have been a yes person your whole time at work. Oh, sure, I'll take that on. Oh, yeah, I can help with that, you know. And maybe now is the time to kind of start saying, you know, oh, you know. And pe sometimes there's a bit of resistance from the people that you work with. Um, but it's also important to kind of set that, that balance right from the get-go upon your return. That I'm going to be trying to do some more self-care. Um, and that's okay. And, and self-care during the day, right? Um, taking the breaks to kind of recharge, eating well. Your brain is working when you're working and it works best on fresh, um, healthy varieties of foods and be fruits, vegetables, protein, water. Our brains get sluggish when we're not hydrated and it's really important to do that. And stretching, you know, especially with desk jobs, I find, you know, you're in that kind of hunched over position typing all day. And it's really important to even, you know, you can uh, Google and look up chair stretches, right, mm -hmm. where you can do some chair activities. Um, it's good for your hips and pelvis and your feet and your legs to get up and move around. But, you know, if you're very really limited in your space, doing some of that stretching from a chair would be great. Um, so just little tips. Keep a list of your issues. Um, so this is very helpful in that back to work setting, you know, after treatment, you're trying to recover, you know, I've got tiredness, right? I have poor sleep, I'm weak, I'm tired easily, I've got brain fog. So by setting up a little list of what the issue is, how it affects your daily life, and what are you doing about it? That shows your insurance provider, your healthcare team, and yourself that these are legit things. You know, if I need to take a rest after doing the dishes, that's pretty impactful. And that goes back to those spoons of energy, right? Um, and then what you're doing about it. So it shows that you're just not complaining about a symptom. You're actually working towards it. And again, if you're having issues, you know, with some of these things, reaching out to us on your care team um, is very helpful to try and help improve some of these things. Maybe there's something you haven't tried. Maybe it's a side effect of medication that you need some help with. So this is helpful to bring to your appointments, to your care providers, keep an up-to-dated list, and, and that way you're kind of working. It's a working plan, right? And then thinking about your uh, work assessment. So, you know, taking a pen and paper and really just mapping this out. What type of work do you do? Is it full-time or part-time? Um, is it a physical job? Is it a desk job? Do you have any re uh, restrictions? So maybe it's a heavy lifting restriction. Maybe it's um, you need some ergonomic assessment um, so that your computer and workstation is good. Um, maybe you need good shoes if you're on your feet all day. Um, and maybe you've got some neuropathies in your feet that are impacting how you're working on your feet all day. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need some flexibility. 
during the day. So you might be able to sit for part of it and stand for part of it. Um, so it's really important just to kind of think about how you work in your day. Um, and do you need to change things up? Um, can you go back to the same job that you were doing? Do you want to? And that's where that kind of assessment is, you know, is this something that's really fulfilling me, but I'm just struggling with it right now because I'm finding my way back to work? Or is it something that's really not been satisfying to you over the years? And do you need to consider, you know, changing that up? And um, there's counseling again around, um, you know, sorting through some of those thoughts and emotions. There are some vocational rehab programs that sometimes the insurance companies can help uh, with. And it's really important that your managers um, really want to, you know, support somebody coming back to work. Um, but sometimes they may not understand how the cancer and the treatments and the side effects that you're struggling with, how that affects your work and ability. If they see that your hair is grown back, they think you're good to go, right? They may not understand all those uh, underlying uh, side effects and issues that people are struggling with. So it's really important just to think about that and figuring out a way to communicate that with your employer. I do have some other questions, but I think I'll, I'll let Cheryl continue with the slides and then we'll, we'll ask them at the end. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks, Kathleen. So um, I'm hoping some of this may, may touch on some of those questions, but we always see that the ideal is a gradual return to work, huh, Lori? That yeah. it's not just bang, Monday morning on when you're slated to be back and it's, you know, eight hours a day, five days a week. That That is um, not what we like to see. Uh, the ideal would be a gradual return so that maybe for that first week, you may be doing a, a couple of hours, um, you know, two days a week. And then the next week, you're tacking on um, a little bit more hours and then so on and so forth. So that um, the research says the ideal is that returning to work fully um, is achieved uh, at the eight week mark. And so sometimes we see it differs from workplace to workplace, and it could be between six weeks and 12 weeks even. Um, but that, yes, again, ideally, it isn't that you're back full time shebang, you know. And if the idea, um, if I could kind of put that into your, your thoughts right now of returning to work fully once you start and being back to full time ish by eight weeks seems a bit overwhelming, then it may be an indication that it might be a little bit too soon, you know, so it's kind of a, a guidepost to go by. Um, and also what we encourage is that you think of a return to work as part of recovery. So sometimes we see um, our ladies being really hard on themselves. Well, oh my goodness, like I'm not back to 100%. I, I can't handle a return to work. Well, actually, it's a little bit gentler on yourselves if you go, you know what, returning to work is part of my recovery. And so it's a slow process, just like everything else. And it sort of uh, takes the pressure off of you. So ideally, you're, you, your employer, your insurance, insurance provider, and sometimes that comes along with a case manager, you all agree to a schedule. And figuring out what time of day is best for you, uh, we always encourage that you advocate for yourself. So if, for example, you're not a morning person, you know, I'd prefer to start my, you know, uh, gradual return to work in the afternoons at first, you know, rather than assuming I'll, I'll be there and ready to go at 8.30 in the morning. Can that happen? And again, sort of just advocating for your needs. Um, so there's a little bit of a, an example there, um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for a few hours for a week or two, but again, just being communicative with your workplace. And so going to the to the next slide, Lori, um, just continuing on, sometimes it might be helpful to kind of have a three column list of things that you're ready to tackle. So during a gradual return to work, these are the duties that I would be prepared, you know, to take on. Um, and then these are the duties, the middle column are for when I return to full time. And then anything beyond that long term, we can talk about it, you know, in six months. And so usually the gradual return thoughts starts off with just a reorientation, some job training, sometimes job shadowing, 
then a return to full time, maybe any supervisory tasks or major um, tasks that you take on independently, maybe that's when, you know, that happens when you're back to full time. And then anything that you used to do, maybe, you know, on the side of your desk to help out committees, presentations, special projects, talk to your employer about, you know what, let's not even talk about that right now six months down the road might be some time a good time to talk about this and then just responding to that COVID question you know Mm -hmm. that's one of your needs too right right now so um, being um, open with your employer about you know I have some concerns about um, going back into an environment where there might be you know uh, exposure to to COVID and then putting it on them I think is what I would suggest because that's their responsibility to ensure safety and that protocol is being um, respected and, 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 and the guidelines are put into place. So what are you going to do for me, you know, to ensure that I'm safe and successful in my return to work in that regard, and, and just having that conversation? So um, next slide, Lori, thank you. Um, Some people um, have some thoughts about what to share with colleagues. And yeah, that's something that um, we encourage. That's an individual decision. Comfort level we see across the board with with the women we work with as to what works for them. Some women like to be very open and some women feel that having conversations with people is helpful emotionally for them. Others, you know, feel like they just like to have it very private and that's okay too and maybe one person at work knows a little bit about what's going on oftentimes is, is a supervisor um, but other than that um, that's you know your choice and so some tips about um what what to consider because coworkers may want to kind of check in and say hey how's it going but they also you know might feel awkward about that and um, they want you to know that they care but they also don't want to make you feel uncomfortable some strategies that I've seen women um, come up with on their own I mean brilliant uh, one when women just chose one person you know whether it be a manager or whoever you trust to say so and so is coming back to work. Um, um, on this date, you know, uh, these are the the uh, job duties that you might see her engaging in. And, you know, again, tacking on whatever you feel comfortable. Um, she would prefer to keep, you know, things just on a professional level for now, you, you know, kind of wording it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and some, you know, when they communicate, uh, they say, you know, she's open to ask, asking questions and talking about things. So feel free to share that with her. Um, so, again, Again, kind of trying to be creative sometimes, but direct about your needs. Um, some people choose to email everybody on their own, you know, and kind of take that on. So again, it's sort of up to you about what you use, what you choose to share and how. And so a little bit here about disability insurance providers. Um, Sometimes these companies need medical updates and they get that from their doctor, your doctors, but they really should be working with you on these accounts. We see differences across the board though, like in my experience anyway. Um, Halori is like what what each company chooses to offer. Some might have resources like physiotherapy, occupational therapy, a psychologist assessment, some want you to try volunteering first before a return to work. We've seen, yeah, opportunities to job train first. So maybe if you're comfortable talking to your employer about what's available to you, again, like what can or what can you, uh, the disability insurance provider, what can you offer for me to ensure a successful return? And I want to just say here as well that, you know, if you're having some challenges with your Uh, case manager for the disability part, um, you know, we get involved with that sometimes too when needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Picking our brains is fine too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're listed there as uh, under help and support, as well as knowing that Cancer Care offers a brain fog course uh, for facility, led by facilitators that are very trained in this approach. So it's, I think, an eight week program, no cost. It's, uh, you would just call the main reception line and there's a number to ask questions and register if you feel that it's for you. Absolutely. Yeah. So just, sorry, uh, Laurie, did I interrupt you? 
Oh, yep. So just a couple of online resources at the top right of your screen, you'll see cancerandwork.ca. Cancer and work is one word. Thank you, Laurie. You might want to uh, go on to that website. It's a Canadian one, where not only you can kind of get some information, but healthcare providers and employers can as well. Uh, once you click on that um, first to the left tab there to get some info, there's some self assessments about, you know, how you're feeling physically, mentally, things to kind of get you thinking more about whether a return to work is right for you at this time. And the last screen, thank you, Lori, is um, another under the Princess Margaret website. Um, they have education modules on um, cancer-related brain fog. Again, just a quick 15-minute assessment um, and fatigue fatigue as well. So it's either free, it kind of gets you thinking. And I think you you submit your email and you get those assessments, as well as some information that's available there from the BC Cancer Agency. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, a question um, to both you and Lori about, um, about kind of the self assessment you mentioned about kind of keeping a, a, a log, a daily log about some of the issues that you're dealing with. Somebody asked about pain though and feeling different issues on different days like so that it's sort of a like I guess the experiences are changing all the time and then how do you relate those changing experiences or how do you communicate them with an, uh, an employer that you're having different pains or different issues on different days. Right so you know um, again keeping that log of your symptoms how it's impacting you and what you're doing about it um, communicating and that's part of that negotiation when you're doing that back to work right you need to be um, you know needing flexibility so right I need small short uh, increments of time in order to try some back to work but I also need the flexibility if I can't sit for long periods of time because of pain then I've got to be able to get up and move around or maybe I need to be able to lay down somewhere Right. And if you're having that much issue around pain, maybe it's not the right time to be going back to work. Right. Um, talking to your healthcare team, what is the source of that pain? Do you need some physio? Do you need some pain medication? Do you need a referral to the pain symptom clinic? There's all sorts of um, things that could be going on. So I would encourage you to, um, if it's breast cancer, you can call me. Um, if it's uh, gynae cancer, then call Michelle Elwood and we can kind of talk about those symptoms that you're struggling with um, and whether it's appropriate to go back to work right now. Yeah, it's really good advice.